Hello everybody, uh, this is TC Atomic Jedi, uh, and it seems that the good news keeps on coming because now uh, big banks in the world have announced that they want to support new nuclear power, which is amazing news. So let's see what's going on. Uh, first, we will go to the Financial Times, where you can see uh, the news. So the world's biggest banks pledge support for nuclear power, and this is including uh, the Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. That's the reason why I had Warren Buffett uh, on here, because uh, I believe that he owns at least one of these, or is the CEO at the mother company of at least one of these. Um, and they do so uh, to boost the COP28 goal of tripling nuclear capacity. Now, for those who don't know, we currently have roughly 500 gigawatts of nuclear capacity in the world. And if you want to triple that, that's 1,500 that needs to be not built, you need to build a thousand, but at least you need to build a thousand gigawatts of nuclear power, uh, nuclear power capacity. Uh, translate that to nuclear power plants like an EP1000, that's like 900 something, 900 nuclear power plants that need to be built. And if you look at the news that we had about all these nuclear power plants in the past, then it stands to reason that this news is very much uh, welcome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave uh, this link here down below so that you can read the news for yourself. But first, let's go through uh, why banks weren't supporting nuclear, because that was a real problem. So first, I want to dish out a little bit punishment towards the people who believe that renewables can do it all, because I don't think that renewables can do it all, far from it. And the major problem with, especially in the West, was that in all these discussions about how to reduce carbon emissions, um, we tended to make the means the goal. So the means to reduce those carbon emissions was, you know, the technology that you need to create the electricity that you were using uh, that came from coal plants and gas plants and such. Uh, but also for the cars, for all the transportation that we're doing, and uh, all the industry. Because in, in the end, uh, still like 85 or 90% of all the energy that we put into mankind uh, comes from fossil fuels. It, it, it's that big. So deploying renewables became a goal in and of itself. Um, and, and, and with that came... Uh, a lot of wishful thinking. So what you see is that there's a lot of people who are uh, trying to model systems. They say, okay, listen, we we use 100 terawatt hours a year, and if we build enough renewables to uh, basically uh, to 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 generate those 100 terawatt hours per year, uh, then we're all right. Now the trouble is that renewables rarely uh, produce power. When, you, when there's actual demand, so you have a discrepancy between uh, supply and demand. And in order to fix that problem, we, th we said, well, we can store electricity. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a lot of batteries, and we're going to build a lot of hydrogen and such, and, and that's going to make uh, our system match the need. So, and, and this in the end turns out uh, to become a problem because many people say, well, renewables are so cheap, you can't ever compete against renewables. But the trouble is, in order to make a reliable electricity system that supplies electricity to the customer whenever he or she or it needs it, you need to overbuild renewables to such an extent that, that, there's, that, that there's a vast pool of capacity that is rarely ever used, which costs money. Uh, you need to attach all these renewables to a grid, and this grid has to be able to uh, handle this overcapacity. So you need more cables, not just, not just, you know, not just hook it into the system, but you also have to beef up the system in order to make sure uh, that the system can handle all this oversupply when you need to, the, the extra supply to store uh, into batteries and hydrogen. And uh, in the end, what you see is 
we now have a couple of countries and, and, and states in the United States, for instance, that have done all this work, have invested heavily in renewables and in backup storage and all those things. And, and it turns out that those countries are paying more for electricity rather than less. So, you know, having this renewables target, which we still have, just isn't smart and it isn't helping and the last point that I failed to address here was if, if you look at these com these countries that have high renewable penetrations, it is not uncommon for you to see uh, bankruptcies in industry. In the Netherlands, for instance, we had two aluminium factories. Both of them have gone bankrupt. And in Germany, we see the same process. So they have invested, uh, I believe, well up to a trillion uh, euros in uh, renewables currently, and it simply isn't working. And they also they also killed their nuclear industry. So let's see. Um, so what we just said, all we need is wind, solar, batteries, and hydrogen, or a, 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 and eventually some plugged hydroelectrical storage. Uh, if you if you look at the the, the one hundred percent renewable plans by Mark C. Jacobson, you can see that they rely heavily on uh, pumped hydro storage. Um, and this hype surrounding renewables was so big, uh, so effective, that all these countries, all these states basically said, well, we are not going to bother with nuclear anymore because you, you see how much renewables we are building. Look at how cheap it is becoming. Uh, and, 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 and basically what they were doing was they were underselling the value of nuclear. And you can see them in 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 the screen right now, I mean, the high power density is something that people say, well, what do I care if I have a million square miles of desert? I just put the desert, you know, I, I just, just blanket it with, with PV panels and I'll get my electricity. Um, whereas the nuclear power plant does the same work on the size of a postage, postage stamp, basically. Uh, the resiliency, so you see that these nuclear power plants have a very high availability factor because they don't have high failure rates or they have low failure rates. And then the high availability, which is, you know, it's the reliability uh, argument. Um, it is there when you need it. And finally, the flexibility, because this is something that people think that nuclear can't do, which is untrue. Nuclear is incredibly flexible. It can ramp up, it can ramp down. Uh, that some countries have rules against it doesn't mean that they can't because there's plenty of countries where nuclear power plants do wrap up and down to follow the load. Why would you keep producing electricity when it's not needed? So um, then looking at it from a nuclear industry perspective, what was the problem there? Uh, the nuclear project cost overruns were accepted as the new normal, right? So if you if if you if you brought up nuclear in any discussion, um, most people would then say, well, look at Vogel or look at uh, VC Summers, you know, look at all those plans, those cost overruns. They are now the, the most expensive power plants in the world. Yeah, they might be. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the next one will be the same or the next after that or the next after that. There's this assumption in these people that the nuclear industry doesn't learn from this or that we as a species don't learn from this, which is simply not true. We do learn and we do want to do better. And um, these these badly managed post Fukushima uh, accident or, or, or projects, they simply had had a lot of uh, yeah headwind that they had to contend with. So. I've, I've, I've named the thing, the Tohoku earthquake. Uh, that was basically the event that killed most of the nuclear momentum uh, coming off the first decade of the 2000s. Back in 2007, uh, the Dutch were planning four new nuclear power plants, for instance. Uh, if we look at the combined uh, if you look at the coal page, these are these are combined operations licenses for new nuclear power plants. 
most of those power plants that you see there that will never be built or perhaps will be built if the United States actually pursues uh, getting these plants built despite uh, what has happened. Uh, they, were, they were planned in the first decade of the 2000s. And there were other countries as well that were planning uh, a nuclear renaissance. Even Germany was considering uh, ending the nuclear exit at that time. But Angela Merkel, she folded when Fukushima happened. Everybody, every, everyone was freaked out. So we had a real appetite for new nuclear. Fukushima happened and it petered out. That's basically what happened. So uh, before we continue, this is the midway of the video. Uh, please, if you would like to support me, you can do so on Patreon, which for which you find the link in the bottom of this video you can leave a comment because i really want to uh, engage with you people talk about this subject which is tremendously important and liking the video obviously is going to help push this video onto other people's feeds so now what has happened since and we're talking about since fukushima you know um and, and, and what we see now is we have invested so much money and so much time and so much effort into deploying renewables that it has become abundantly clear that they cannot carry the load alone. It's simply, it's simply it, 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 it might be technically possible, but it is highly unlikely that we will actually go the length we need to go in order to make sure that our demand can be met. Now, people understand, and I'm talking about smart people here, uh, people from big tech, for instance, or pe people from big money, as we can now see, uh, people in government, people in politics. They see that the gamble didn't work. They also see what it means to go all out on renewables. You can see vast swaths of deserts being filled with uh, PV, PV panels. You can see hundreds of hundreds, maybe thousands of windmills propping up everywhere. You can see uh, huge plans to build 70 gigawatts of offshore wind in the North Sea, for instance, which is a crazy plan, a crazy plan. And, and, and what was going on during this time, the early adoption or the early real adoption of renewables, which was in the second decade of the 2000s, uh, you first saw the Generation 4 movement and then particularly uh, the molten salt reactors, a push for a more uh, reliable and safe reactor, one that was smaller, had less risk, uh, was was more easily easily managed. Uh, that got a lot of people, you know, a, a lot of people going again, uh, being enthusiastic about nuclear. This happened for me in 2012. Then you got the SMR movement, which gained even more momentum. So now you have the Gen 4 movement, you have the, the SMR movement that lays on top of that. People who are clamoring for the construction of BWRX300, which is a boiling water reactor by GE Hitachi, but also people clamoring for the construction of the UK SMR, which is a, a small modular reactor that is being designed by Rolls-Royce. And that eventually culminated. So what you see now is that there's there is projects being planned left and right for these these reactors. Generation four is still slow. Oak Low is trying to do generation four. Uh, you have other uh, molten salt reactor uh, developers that want to do generation four. Abilene Texas University is one of the. Uh, the leading universities at this moment. In this moment, you have Kairos. You also have Terra Power, obviously, who are also trying to do Gen 4. And they are trying to do SMR at the same time. And finally, what you see is that within this group of enthusiasts, uh, even the big reactors have become accepted again. And there's, there, there's, there's enough reasons to be optimistic about all of them. Um, personally, I, I do understand the the, the 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 pros and cons of all these these uh, these reactor types, uh, but I think that we need to do them all. 
simply, I, I think that st staying innovative, trying to find new things is always better than just doing what you did. We're not, we're not Russia. Um, uh, we have to improve, we have to do better. And yes, that doesn't mean that we need to build an improved version of the AP-1000. Uh, I think that we need 100 AP-1000s or maybe even 1000 if we can afford them. Um, or if we have the time to build an EPRs, uh, same token. But I also think that we need uh, 100 X300s and 100 IMSRs and 100 uh, ultra-safe nuclear uh, micro-reactors with their graphite moderated, or what is it? It's not even graphite, it's, 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 it's something else. Uh, silicon carbide, uh, super safe fuel elements. Uh, personally, I hope that this has become clear now. I am ambivalent to what is best. I think that uh, the nuclear power reactor that gets built and gets reordered and gets built faster and even even within budget next time is the one that we need. Uh, so so make of that what you want. So what you see now happening is after we we've come out uh, now we have culminated as a, in a sense we have we have the gen 4 movement that is that has its momentum we have the small modular reactor movement that has its momentum we also see that now uh Okilwoto has come online flammenville is now uh having nuclear fissions occur in its reactor core Vogel has been completed. Baraka, the the, the APR fourteen hundred at, at 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 the United Arab Emirates, uh, they are now producing electricity. And what you see is that a switch has been turned. Um, this, together with the fact that renewables don't make electricity cheaper, uh, the knowledge that we can we can actually finish these big projects, these nuclear projects. What you see is that. The, the switch has been flipped. So China and Russia and India, they were already going back gangbusters on nuclear. Uh, China for its domestic purposes, India the same, and Russia was trying to sell uh, nuclear reactors in Africa. That's why I na n name it the battle for Africa and its cheat. And, and then what you saw was that France said, okay, we are going to build 16 60 new EPRs. Canada said we are going to refurbish not only Darlington but also Pickering, which are two really big nuclear power plants. Um, and in Canada, they are now also building the first commercial SMR, the BWRX300, which is also situated at Darlington. And now you see that the United States and Europe uh, also have adopted this pro-nuclear stance and are not just have a pro-nuclear stance but uh, policies are being written and adopted to increase nuclear nuclear capacity you know in all these countries so the tripling of the nuclear pledge i think that's a that's a key a key turning point um the pro-nuclear Policies that you see happening in the United States, where they are clearly thinking about what can we do with our coal plants? Can we can we uh, turn these coal plants into nuclear power plants? Uh, all the investment and R and D going on in SMRs, uh, the fact that they are mapping the new nuclear potential, which I addressed in a previous uh, video, where where you could see that the the potential for nuclear in 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 the United States is huge. It's like well up to 300 gigawatts. And you can see that there is this new movement on the R&D front. So you're, you're, we're getting this, this, this. I believe it's the Hermes uh, test reactor from, from Kairos. We're getting the molten salt reactor at Abilene, Texas University. But you also can see uh, TerraPower and I mentioned Oklo earlier. So, so uh, th there is movement, there is, there, you see the potential, you see the, 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 the momentum building up. And right now what we see is that the, uh, the banks are saying, yes, we want to support this. And, and this is not strange because intelligent people at these banks, they see what is going on. They see that companies who are trying to do really large renewable projects have serious troubles. 
Um, they see that that there's there's problems with offshore wind. They see that they they also see that Sun Power went bankrupt, which was a a, a huge uh, solar PV uh, factory in California, I believe. Um, and they, and they and they also see that despite all the investment, everything was supposed to get cheaper, but but companies simply can't keep competitive in these renewable heavy uh, areas of the world. So what do we need right now? And this is this is where I get really passionate. Uh, the projects, it, it all starts with the projects. We need tangible projects where people are working on the deployment of a new nuclear power plant somewhere. And I named the AP1000s, the CANDUs, the EPRs, the APR1400s, Whatever you can get your hands on, whatever is on offer today, whatever we can start planning and start trying to build, uh, that's what we need to do. By the way, I'm not, I'm not, I, I do believe that building new nuclear power plants the same as much as possible is good. Um, but if you look at China, for instance, what you see there is they, they, they also built a lot of different nuclear power plants and yet they still got proficient in it. So I believe that simply doing the act of building the nuclear power plant and doing that with uh, excellence in mind and trying to make sure um, that that's the best uh, way of doing it <clears throat> uh, is going to end up making each subsequent nuclear reactor that they build cheaper. Uh, I also want to uh, break a lance for the uh, Generation 4 reactors, for the small modular reactors. And finally, and this is the most important bit, we need companies that can deliver these projects on time and on budget. And for that, we need a lot of tooling up. A lot needs to be done in order to make sure that we uh, end up building these reactors at speed, at a rate that is uh, actually... Uh, going to uh, help us get rid of these carbon emissions, but also of air pollution and such. So the banks, they are finally on board. Uh, I think that this was one of the missing pieces. They were looking, you know, they were a little bit hesitant. If you look at uh, what is happening now, we're in the watershed moment as we speak. And the first one through the wall gets a bloody nose. So that's why everybody is trying to hold back. They don't want to go through the wall. You know, they don't want to be first and get a bloody nose. Uh, but big tech is taking uh, is taking the hits here, what you, what you see with uh, the AI centers and the, and the data centers. I used to be a server administrator myself, so I know how energy intense uh, the data industry is and why nuclear is a, 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 a high price uh, ticket item that they're going to pursue regardless of whether it is expensive or not. All they want is reliable electricity uh, in order to make sure that they can keep doing what they're doing. So with that, you came to the end of this video. I want to uh, thank my uh, Patreon supporters. Uh, this is a, a small list of the people that support me. Uh, do so uh, by uh, pledging a little bit of money uh, to donate a little bit of money whenever I make a video. And the Anthropocene Institute and Christopher Bergen and Daniel C are absolute champions in this regard. I love all these people uh, that are mentioned here. Um, so if you want to join them, please go to my Patreon page, uh, make sure that you, uh, you know, become a member there. So, and on this screen, you can see, uh, you can subscribe, you can see, uh, you have another link to my Patreon and, and there you see a video that you can watch right now. Thank you all for watching. I made a strong force be with you. Bye-bye.